Okay. So I have done a quick review of several classes of parameter adaptation algorithms we have learned so far. Okay. So what I have motivated you to that even if consider a serious parallel parameter adaptation algorithm, we have this picture here. Okay. So stability of this structure gives me that the arrow will converge to zero. But this arrow converges to zero, this adaptation arrow converging to zero doesn't mean theta tilde is converging to zero because theta tilde might as well be orthogonal with phi, making this to be zero. So turns out that from here to here, we need additional step. Need uh, more analysis. And this is what we're going to talk about today. <coughs> so keep this uh, equation in mind. Epsilon k converges to zero. Let's take a look at how mathematically this means. So let me actually derive this set of equations now. So first, this first equation simply is this. Epsilon k plus 1 equals to, if you look at this structure here, Epsilon k plus 1 equals to a hat processing yk. So it's yk plus 1 passing through a hat. But yk plus 1 is nothing but the input passing through the plant. Okay, so this is the first part. And the second part, epsilon k plus 1 is this guy minus this guy. So it's minus b hat processing uk. So this is the meaning of epsilon k plus 1 going to 0. Okay, now this, this is a the hint from what step one to step two. If epsilon k plus one goes to zero and you process the signal by a z minus one, is this true that if epsilon go to zero, this will go to zero? Right, this should uh, be pretty obvious. So from here to here, you can get this. But this is a question aside. If, let's say, a z minus 1, uh, let me use a different notation, e. So if some signal passing through a filter, it gives me an output 0, does that guarantee e itself will go to 0? So it's not guaranteed. Be careful about this. So it's true from here to here, but it's not true from here to here. <coughs> so here, multiply this equation by a z minus 1 on both sides. I'm going to get a hat b minus, so I have an a here, a b hat. Okay. <coughs> so yeah, let me now derive the remaining steps. So now, I'm going to add and subtract. Because the reason I'm doing this step is that you know from our review at the beginning of the class, I want something about theta tilde. I want to see whether theta tilde is going to zero or not. But here, this equation is going only giving me a hat, b hat, which is containing theta hat. So I'm going to add and subtract terms. So for simplified notation, I'm going to uh, omit all these indices. I'm going to add and subtract. Let's see. What should I add? Try A, B, and see what's going to happen. Okay. This guy is going to give me A hat minus A, B, then plus 
A B minus B hat. Let me check. A hat times B minus A B plus A B minus A B hat. So it looks correct. Okay. And this guy equals A tilde B plus A B tilde. And this contains theta tilde information. Okay. So the final result, if we do this, is going to be look like this. Okay. After I add and subtract terms, I can arrive at this equation here. <coughs> well, the definitions of a tilde is this: a hat minus a. Okay. If we focus on the final co equation here. Okay, look at this part. This, this is nothing but a new polynomial, all right? Polynomial of uh, g to the power of negative one, actually, okay? Let me denote this polynomial as, uh, for example, alpha one plus alpha, uh, alpha zero plus alpha one g minus one, all the way to alpha n plus m to the power of g to the times g to the power of negative n minus n. So let me double check. The order of a, so our assumptions are b divided by a, the orders are one plus a one g negative one plus a n g minus n p zero plus p m g negative m. So it looks like correct because the order of a times b tilde is going to be n plus m, and the final order here is n plus m. Okay, same thing for this side. The order looks correct. Okay, and here are the, the polynomials. So uh, I have just written this down actually. B equals this. A equals this. And B tilde is uh, put every coefficient on tilde. And A tilde is uh, put every coefficient on tilde. The difference here, be, be careful. Uh, the leading coefficient here for A tilde is going to be 0 because A hat, A hat is going to be 1 plus A1 hat G negative 1. Okay, so the first two coefficients is going to cancel if you do subtraction here. That's the uh, only place that's a uh, little bit not standard here, okay? <coughs> so now, looking at this guy. Hi. All right, sure. Hmm. Oh, it's gonna be unfo unfortunate for those who didn't come today. Okay. So we're talking about this. This equation here. So if you think about this, the coefficients alpha zero, alpha one to alpha m n plus uh, alpha m plus n, okay, what will they depend on? They will depend on the coefficients of each individual polynomials here. So alpha zero, alpha one, is gonna depend on the coefficients of B and the coefficients of A tilde, right? Two questions to ask. So the first question is, uh, is this true? Okay, so if we have alpha zero, alpha one, all these are zero, okay? If alpha one are all zero, Will this guarantee that all my coefficients here, a tilde and b tilde, will be zero or not? Mm -hmm. Oh, batteries are.
Okay, so some technical issues, but uh, let's come back to here. Look at this equation now. Two questions to think about, okay? If, if I see all these alpha zero, alpha coefficients are zero, will that guarantee us AI, AI and BI tilde, will this go to zero or not, okay? And the second question to ask, this question is actually easier, so I think uh, this is the easier question to attack. If alpha i is not zero, can we still have this? Okay. Even if all the coefficients of this polynomial is not zero, can we still guarantee that this guy will be zero or not? Okay. So the final, <coughs> the final picture I'm I'm getting is that uh, the final the final goal, if you think about it, we want to achieve is that we want to assure, so we want, we want uh, alpha i being zero can imply us a i tilde and b i tilde, these are zero, okay? And we want, <coughs> and we want to make this, this polynomial to be zero, <coughs> this guy to be zero, okay? Only if alpha, alpha i are zero, okay? That's the, that's the final goal we are arriving, okay? So. <coughs> okay, so what do you think? Let me call this question one and this question two. What would be your guess for question Y and question two? <clears throat> question one, yes or no? Or we cannot conclude, we cannot make a conclusion yet. Yes, for sure, so exactly. So. From here to here, from the right hand side to the left hand side, no problem. What about this direction? If I have a polynomial <coughs> whose coefficients are zero and this polynomial is composed of this, can we guarantee these coefficients are zero? <coughs> So looks tricky, right? So this direction uh, needs uh, needs certain assumptions. This is what we're going to talk about next. What about the question two? If alpha i is not zero, can we still guarantee this guy to be zero? For example, let me see. Uh, example. If uk is one, right? Then I'm gonna have one minus c to the negative one. Uk is gonna be zero, right? <coughs> However, so you see this. This is what we have seen last time, uh, previously. This is the internal model principle. What about if uk <coughs> If the polynomial is the same polynomial, but uk is one plus, let's say, sine something. Sine, uh, I just put omega zero k, okay? If uk is this guy, then we no longer have we no longer have this uh, filtered result to be zero, okay? So. The question, if we want to fully answer this question here, the short question is, uh, it depends on you, okay? So for different views, we will have different results. <coughs> if UK looks like this, what will be, and this polynomial is, uh, 
that is separate thing. The VUK looks like this, and the polynomial is the alpha zero is a first order polynomial. Okay. If this is the, the case here, what are the only possibilities for alpha zero and alpha one? So the only the only way for this to be zero is this two elements are zero. Okay? So now given these uh, big pictures, think backwards and see what we're gonna achieve, what we want to achieve. What we want to achieve now is we can select our input U. So we want to select our input U such that when this guy is zero, I can have guaranteed alpha zero, alpha one to alpha n plus n to be zero. And if I can guarantee that, if I can guarantee this are zero, then looking at this direction, here, alpha i to be zero, we want to be able to derive the conditions that will give us these desired results, okay? The parameter estimation error becomes zero. So that's the big picture of uh, what we're gonna do next. Any questions for this? <coughs> So if we don't have questions, let me go to this part. Let's first analyze the relationship between between alpha i and a tilde, p tilde. Okay. So the quick question is: uh, Yeah, we can have we can have guaranteed if and only if condition if b tilde, a b z, and a z are co prime. So it's a good result. So it says that we can have guaranteed under some conditions, which is very easy to satisfy. Okay. Look at this equation. Remember, you have learned. Uh, we have we have seen this before. What is this actually? I have. For, uh, let me make it more specific. I know b. I know a, and I know alpha. Suppose I know alpha alpha at zero to alpha n, mi n minus one, and I want to solve for I want to solve for a tilde and b tilde. Okay, so meaning I want to express a tilde and b tilde the coefficients as uh, as uh, alpha zero alpha one and the coefficients of a b. Okay, so what is this equation actually? It, it has a name. This kind of structure has a name. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. So, exactly. This is the Dauphin Tai equation. Well, what are the conditions for us to have unique solutions for A tilde and B tilde? So, that's A, B, and B in co prime, right? So. Exactly. It's, it's sufficient, good enough if you get the big picture. The remaining steps are just uh, verifications for this, okay? So the right-hand side, you see, is composed of terms of, look at this guy. It's composed of terms of A tilde times B and A times B tilde, these coefficients, okay? So if I regard this as the unknown, if I regard the tilde as I unknown, and I put this, put this here to solve, this is what we want to solve, okay? Then we can construct, we can construct, look at this. This A tilde and B tilde is linear, the, uh, it's a linear in this equation, and the coefficients for these guys are a, P, and B, J. So we can write these coefficients in the matrix S. So S is composed of uh, A, P, and B, J. And on the left-hand side, we can have the coefficients of uh, A zero, uh, alpha zero to alpha one, et cetera. Okay, so we learned from dauphin tai equation that this matrix is non-singular. 
if and only if A and B, capital A and B, are co-prime. Okay? So if S is non-singular, now this is a final, final part of the result. If S is non-singular, and we have these, so look at the original, original condition. If S is non-singular, and we have these, so you see, these guys have to be zero, right? I multiply this by the inverse of S. Then this guy has to be zero, okay? So you see exactly, uh, as long as they are co-prime, as long as S is non-singular, this being zero is nothing but this being zero. They are exactly equivalent, okay? So this is uh, good news because in practice, when I write down a Planck equation, this is usually uh, co-prime, meaning that uh, they don't have things to cancel in each other. So that's question one. If you understand question one, question two is, uh, is very easy, okay? So we have talked about, I used one example of uh, one minus D negative one times UK time, times one. Okay, from there you see uh, this is not guaranteed if we don't have good uh, input yield. Okay, let's take another example. Uh, in this example, I'm using U is a sinusoidal signal here. Okay, so I'm saying the order of this polynomial is second order system. So it looks like this. Okay, so this is uh, the condition we are giving. So this guy, UK is zero, okay? So it's sufficient enough because cosine omega K is just the real part of EJ omega K. So e to the power of J omega K equals cosine omega K plus J sine omega K. If the output with respect to this guy is zero, then guaranteed if we take the real part of this input, output will still be zero, okay? <coughs> now, take a look at this guy and give me some, oh, I already show it here. So look at this guy and we can immediately see that this go to zero does not guarantee alpha zero and alpha one, alpha two goes to zero, okay? So if you remember this, this is essentially the internal model principle, right? Huh? This. Huh? Where? Oh, here. You know the rules, right? So you can get some hints for the next homework. By the way, uh, there's only one homework left, which is gonna be due in the in the reading week, so the homework is uh, it's not it's not a lot of problems, but uh, you'll get some practice of doing parameter adaptation algorithms. I think that that's a very good practice to understand everything here. Okay, so this is essentially the internal model principle. Okay, for this kind of alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, uh, here, we can have this go to zero if the input is sinusoidal. But if this is the case and I have UK contains two sinusoidal frequency components, okay? Then you see, when this go to zero, the only way, the only way to achieve this is all these coefficients are being zero, okay? This is the desired case, so it's good information, okay? In a more general, general sense, if we think about this way, Okay, uh, for a single sinusoidal, free sinusoidal signal, sine omega one k, okay? <coughs> Let me put this here. For a single sinusoidal frequency component, for single sine, okay? It's possible that uh, 
we have derived this, you know, one minus two cosine omega z negative one plus z negative two <coughs> sine omega k is zero, okay? So observe this result here. For a single sinusoidal frequency component, I need a second order polynomial to cancel this, okay? Now here, <coughs> if I have two sinusoidal components, I'm assuming omega one doesn't equal to omega two. What is the minimum order of the polynomial here to make the output to be zero? The minimum order. Two? No, the two is for, for, for a single sinusoidal case. Four, right? So you got the trick. For, <coughs> here's the final conclusion. If the total number of parameters is, is three, n plus m is three, okay, then uk should contain at least two frequency components. So let me put this in a more simple way. So if the polynomial is third order, if the polynomial is third order, then uh, UK should at least contain two sine components to make this happen, okay? It cannot be just one because if you have one here, a third order polynomial will possibly give you this output to be zero, okay? <coughs> and if you go from here to the frequency, com frequency domain, so let me give you uh, the frequency domain intuition for this guy. Plot, plot the pole zero part, pole zero uh, plot for this polynomial, for this guy. Okay, so let's work on this. What, what, what's the pole zero locations for this uh, filter here? Okay, so we can do some mathematics. One minus two cosine omega. Cosine omega, what does that equal to? Two, one divided by two, ej omega, yeah, that's enough. Plus or minus, e negative j omega. Plus, right? Oh. So substitute cosine omega, this is the Ola equation. Substitute this to, to the inside then you will see the uh, frequency domain intuition for this result here. Z negative one plus Z negative two, okay? And this guy equals to one minus Ej omega Z negative one, one minus E uh, negative J omega Z minus one. Okay, so well, what are the pole zero locations for this filter now? It's gonna be on the unit circle, so it's this guy and this guy. So let's say, let's say the location is here. So I have one zero here and another zero here, right? Does it have any poles? So it has two poles at the origin, right? So now, look at this guy. And uh, remember what we did. Sine omega k, uh, regardless of sine omega k or cosine. So the input sine omega k equals to uh, two, e j omega minus e negative j omega. 
all right? So the input, let me see. I think I'm missing a J here. This looks correct. So the input, you see exactly. What, what are the frequencies of the input? It has one complex frequency, omega, and another complex frequency, negative omega. I think I'm missing a K here. Yeah. Right? So the frequency of the input, look at this guy, omega and negative omega. What this result, what this result really means is that the filter here, the locations of the zeros should cancel the frequency component omega and negative omega, okay? So do the pole zero plot and uh, you will see this. And this is explaining exactly why we need a second order filter for a single sinusoidal frequency. Because a single sinusoidal frequency contains these two components, E j omega k and E negative j omega k. Okay. So for each of these components, I need one zero to cancel uh, the component here. Things are exactly the same. If you think about the sim easier case, when we do one minus D negative one uh, UK and UK equals to one, exactly the same. If you plot the pole zero plot for this guy, it has a zero at one, it has a pole at the origin, okay? And UK, <coughs> UK, so in this case, UK no longer is a sinusoidal signal, okay? So we just need a first order term to cancel this, all right? Uh, you can think of, you can even think of it this way. UK equals one, which is cosine zero K, okay? And cosine zero K is uh, two, look at here, E times J times zero K plus E negative J zero K, okay? So the locations of these two are exactly here. So omega, it's, a, it's the case for omega equal to zero. So these two zeros shrink, 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 and then converge to this point here. Okay? So long story short, for the input frequency, if the input contains uh, one sinusoidal frequency component, we need two poles, two, two zeros for the polynomial, we need a second order polynomial, okay? So if going to the more general case, if, let's read this result. For the general case, oh, I have a typo. UK, okay? For, for the general case, polynomial uh, times UK here, If, let's go actually follow the order here. If uh, the order n plus m, if n plus m is even, okay, then it has this number of, it has, if it's even, it has m plus n roots. It has n, m plus n zeros. So it has, that means it has n, m plus n divided by two pairs of roots. Okay, if m plus n is odd, then I have m plus n minus one divided by two pairs of roots plus a, plus a real root somewhere, sitting somewhere, okay? Then the theorem is saying this. This is called persistence of excitation for parameter adaptation conversion. So from the name, it's saying that it gives us the conditions for UK to satisfy this convergence condition. So UK simply means UK has to be reaching up to excite the dynamics of the system, okay? Uh, for PAAs with a series parallel predictor, the convergence is guaranteed, okay? 
So summarizing uh, the two points we, we've seen before. The first point is uh, the Plan transfer function is irreducible. So this is uh, the question we answered for question one. And this is the answer we've asked for question two. Okay. If the Plan transfer function is irreducible, meaning uh, uh, A and B are co prime, then uh, we can have guarantee. We can guarantee that uh, alpha i, so this is the first part, alpha i being zero will give us a i b i being zero. Okay. And the second second condition it's asking uh, it's giving us uh, when alpha i when can we guarantee alpha i is zero? Okay. So the here it's saying we need to have enough independent frequency component to guarantee this to guarantee this condition okay and this second condition is giving us the number of frequency components we should get so uh, it's this guy if n plus n is even then it's this is the pair of roots it's the pair of roots plus one so we need at least one more frequency component for the input and if the m plus n is odd, then we need one more. We need this plus one. So that is uh, m plus n plus one divided by two. This number of independent frequency components. Okay? So if this is satisfied, then this, gives, uh, this answers our question two. So it's saying uh, alpha i has to be zero. For this equation to, for equation star to hold. Okay. These are the. So this is the uh, convergence condition for SP predictors. So in the reader. It gives us gi gives you some idea of how to construct frequency reach input u here. Uh, in practice, uh, system identification, we can we usually put a random signal as an input to excite the system dynamics. Okay. All right. <coughs> so up till now, everything we have discussed, if you think about it, is without noise. If I don't have noise in the system, okay? And from now on, we'll start considering the effect of noise on the parameter adaptation identification algorithm. So we can modify the noise in different ways as you can imagine. So this is the way we usually follow. Okay, so we model the noise as it's coming go to going into the system in this way. So if we have this, then we have a z minus one operated on y k equals b operated on u k plus this noise term. Okay, so from here you can get uh, y k to be in this form, okay? So the noise, W, is added upon the result we know very well now. If we have, uh, we can, you, you can also modify, you can also model the noise in this way, but uh, we'll see, this is a special case of this one, so let's take a look. So if the noise goes into the system as an output noise, then we are going to have The second result, you see, is exactly equivalent to UK uh, BZ negative one, AZ negative one, and Y. Okay. So this is equivalent to 
U K B. Then I have something here. Y. Okay. So if you do the algebra, then you will see this is what's what's going to happen. So in order to make an equivalent disturbance here, then you have to multiply by a. Then this and this is going to cancel out. So these two are equivalent. So this noise effect is equivalent to this w here. If you assign w as equivalent w as a, the inverse operated on n. Okay, so we can immediately use the result here. Replace w with this guy, uh, with, yeah, with this guy. In the, in the noise model, okay. <coughs> so if you follow this guy, if you follow this, our first uh, main noise models, then you write out the plant output, this is what we have done. And then when you consider the predictor, okay, we said noise, uh, we don't know what the noise property looks like. So when we predict the output, this is the predicted y hat. I'm using the a posteriori information here. Okay. The predictor doesn't have the noise information. And then if you write out, if you consider the prediction arrow y hat, a uh, y minus y hat, then you're going to see you have theta minus theta hat, k plus one, transpose phi k, plus w k plus one, okay? So again, I'm gonna use the notation that theta tilde equals theta hat minus theta. So this guy is gonna become, is gonna become this. So the a posteriori prediction arrow equals negative theta tilde transpose times phi plus w, okay? And this, uh, as you recall, is the prediction error without noise, okay? So things will become now hopefully more intuitive. If you have this as your prediction error and you put it in your parameter adaptation algorithm, okay? Then you are going to have F phi times epsilon under bar, which is the case without noise, then plus this effect of noise, okay? The first part of the right-hand side looks exactly the same as the previous results, okay? So now, here is the effect of the noise, okay? <coughs> if you take, uh, take, this is how we analyze, this is the usual way analyzing convergence of uh, parameter adaptation algorithm. Take n large, okay? Take a very large n, such that the thetas have already converged, hopefully already converged for this large n. Then think about uh, theta hat, uh, k plus, let me use, uh, N plus A, B, C, D, M, let's, let's use M, okay? So starting from here, be careful about the notation here. So I'm looking at, I'm starting from theta hat K plus N. I've told you this is a very large number. Hopefully this has already converged. So starting from there, I look at the result I have M steps later, okay? Can someone give me what's the equation for this? From here to here. 
What's the relationship between these two? <coughs> it's going to be, so, so let's, let me give you a quick hint. I think you probably already know. So it's going to be m equals theta hat k plus n plus m minus 1 plus, so this is one step ahead, one step uh, back, plus f phi epsilon information, plus something that looks like this. And then you go from here, and then go one more step back, theta hat k plus n plus m minus 2, then plus plus, right? So you see, in the end, it's going to be some summation function of uh, f, I have to be very careful about the index here. I'm going to use i. Let me use i. fi phi i epsilon under bar i plus 1. Okay. This is the information for, for this part. And then the information of the noise. f i phi i w i plus 1. Let me see what's the note. Index. Index is going to be i equal to k plus n. i equal to k plus n. What's the final index here? <coughs> right? Yeah, exactly. So from here, you see, I have, we, we, I told you we have assumed n is large, so these guys uh, have roughly converged. So what are the conditions? What, are, what, what is the condition for this noise term to not influence my adaptation algorithm? This is a desired condition, right? So it means this, this, this noise term should the average behavior, so take summation is considering the average behavior. So the average behavior of this guy should be cancel out, should be zero, right? So in a more statistical sense, this is what, what it means, what it requires. So it means the average behavior, so the expectation of this guy, of this uh, phi w, of this phi w term should be zero, okay? And uh, of course, this gain here, you, you have to, you, you cannot put a very large gain here. And this gain has to uh, become very small in the end, right? So this is called uh, the, the method of average analysis, uh, taking averaging of the parameter adaptation algorithm. By the way, uh, this, this equation wasn't uh, written in the reader. But uh, uh, the reader talked about there is some type of averaging method. But uh, that's exactly something that looks like this. So uh, we did that in order to arrive at this, this, this condition here. So the average behavior, the expectation of phi times w has to go to 0 okay, to make uh, the system not sensitive to noise. Let's see what this condition really means, okay? So uh, I am going to use a simple series parallel parameter adaptation algorithm, okay? Things like recursive least squares. So we have reviewed at the beginning of the class that uh, phi will look like this, okay? Contains information of the output and the information of the input. Okay. What does what does it mean if I have expectation of phi times w is zero? Okay. So it means these elements. So th this is a vector to recognize first. So this vector, the elements of this vector, each of the elements has to be zero. So it means y k and these guys y k to all the way to y k minus n plus y has to be independent of w. 
Okay. Also, u has to be independent of w. Okay. <coughs> so, indeed, actually, it means so. This this is a if condition. Be careful. So it's not an if and only if condition. So if you see, this is very uh, strong requirement actually. If w is white, then it's going to be independent of to these guys, okay? And uh, if u k and w k plus one are independent, this is what we talked about, okay? So if these two hold, then we are going to have this uh, expectation to zero. Guaranteed. <coughs> so this is saying the the take out message from here is that for serious parallel parameter adaptation algorithms to converge, then one of the sufficient conditions is that the noise is white if we model the noise this way. Okay. And UK, WK are independent. This is very easy to satisfy. This is very, very easy to satisfy. This guy is usually not so easy to satisfy. Okay. So take into more deep look into more details of this whiteness condition. You see, WK is really white. Okay. I have given you one example from at the beginning of this section that if the noise is modeling in this way, then the equivalent WK plus one is uh, AZ minus one, NK plus one. Okay, so it's uh, engineering, it's, it's usual practice in engineering that the output noise, the direct output noise usually comes from sensors. And uh, sensors should be designed to have white, noise kind of uh, characteristics. They're usually designed to be this way. So NK plus one is usually white for engineering applications. So now if N is white, then W will not be white because W is filtered version of N. So W will be colored. So this is exactly supporting our intuition here, okay? Let me emphasize that this is for serious parallel parameter adaptation algorithms. And we see the difficulty rising from this convergence condition. Okay. And this is exactly the reasons, the motivations for this parallel adaptation algorithm. Okay. So uh, as a quick review, parallel, parallel par parameter adaptation algorithm uses white hat, which is coming from here. So this is usually independent with WK from this picture here. So now, if you carry out all the analysis, like what we did last time, what we did uh, several slides ago, then this is the result you're gonna get. Expectation of phi times W to be zero does not necessarily require W to be white. As long as W, as long as W are independent with U and Y, Y hat, this is fine. Okay, so this is the good news that uh, parallel parameter adaptation algorithm has uh, have relaxed requirements for convergence. Okay, <coughs> so these are the two uh, main results. So. Hopefully, now you have seen, you, 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 would, you, can, you can see that these are pretty intuitive, okay? So, let's summarize. For serious parallel parameter adaptation algorithm, okay, the PAA with a vanishing adaptation gain, so meaning uh, F is, is reducing. So, I think uh, we mentioned this part, but let me just uh, write out the information. Epsilon, Epsilon, that write out the PAA to let you see more clearly. Phi K, W K. So, uh, first of all, you, you can't keep you can't keep using uh, large 
adaptation gain. You have to reduce this to make this guy, make this effect of this guy to be small. So use a vanish adaptation gain. And then if W is wide, okay, <coughs> and UK is rich in frequency, so this is the excitation, persistent excitation condition, okay, and it's independent from the noise, then we have unbiased parameter convergence, okay. <coughs> so be careful. Many, many students, when they first learn this, become confused about this condition, okay? So keep in mind, this is the parameter convergence condition. This is not the stability condition, okay? So in other words, a PAA, it can be stable, but still give you biased parameter estimate, okay? Be very careful about this. this can be tricky if, uh, if we don't be very careful, okay? <coughs> so that's the first case, and we have seen that this can be difficult, okay? That's why we do parallel PAAs, okay? And it turns out the conver convergence condition is, uh, is more relaxed, okay? So we have seen that we need UK to be independent from WK and UK satisfies the persistent excitation condition, okay? So these are nice, these are very nice. We don't have whiteness assumptions, okay? And you see, this is always the balance in practice. Parallel PAA has better convergence condition, but you see, it has more strict stability requirement. We need the SPR conditions to satisfy. Okay. On the other hand, this serious parallel PAA, uh, the convergence condition is not very, it's, it's hard to satisfy, but the stability is very easy to satisfy. Okay. So usually this is what uh, usual practice can do, can make the best usage of the two, both of them. So we can, first of all, use a serious parallel PAA. It is gonna give us some biased information, but hopefully the bias is not very large, so it still give us some information about the system. Then when this guy has converged, we switch to a parallel parameter adaptation algorithm. So we use this uh, uh, biased but uh, estimated, biased estimated information from the series parallel PAA in this parallel PAA, okay? And hopefully from there, we can very easy to satisfy the SPR condition, okay? For example, you can use, uh, you can use a parallel PAA with a fixed compensator C. Then the C here, the coefficients of C can go from, can come from this SP PAA, okay? So, <coughs> there are basically, many people look at this result and then try to improve the convergence condition here. So in the remaining slide, we talk about, so we have talked about uh, parameter convergence conditions, we have talked about the effect of noise. So in the remaining uh, slide, we're going to talk about how to improve the convergence in the presence of noise, okay? The first way to improve is, uh, by the way, uh, let's ask a very basic big picture type of question. Uh, is it possible to have a universal uh, PAA? that has good convergence for all conditions. Meaning that I construct a PAA that's gonna work out of the box for any kind of practical situation. Okay. 
Okay, so the answer is no. This n no universal, no universal PAA for for all practical cases. The workout is for different uh, noise structures, for different noise dynamics, uh, different people constructed different uh, workouts that can give us better results in this uh, particular noise structure. And this is what we're going to talk about uh, as the first improvement. So this is called least squares, but it's extended least squares. So the idea looks like as, uh, is, is as follows. If the noise can be modeled to be in this way, so this is equivalent to saying that UK B A, the noise going into here is C C N. Oops. B, sorry. B, this is A here. Okay, so you see, essentially this is about W equals uh, noise filtered by a polynomial C. Okay, and this workout looks uh, is, is comes as follows. If NK is white, then we have the, and we have this NK going into the system in this kind of dynamics, then how should we do? to improve the estimate, okay? So the, the result, the, the step to solve this is as follows. First of all, now extend, you see, I have, I know the structure of the noise. Then I can include the structure of the noise in my system dynamics, okay? So I extend theta to theta E extended to contain C1 to Cn, okay? Then I can write out now using the new theta E, the dynamics between uh, dynamics of the output, okay? So put this equation here, then write out the dynamics. So you can intuitively see this phi is gonna contain the original system information plus the new information in this noise model. So the new information in this noise model will depend on NK and NK plus NK minus uh, the, 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 the depends on the order of N, uh, the polynomial NC here. Uh -huh. No, we don't assume A is one. So here, we said this is equivalent to this guy, right? Yes. And yeah, so you see? Yeah. <coughs> All you, in other words, yeah, it's good exercise. Let, let's take a moment to do an exercise. Uh, yeah, so let's take a moment to figure out the, the model first, and then uh, we can work out the remaining next time. So this model, we, there are several ways to derive this. It means y k plus one equals b a u k plus c a n k plus one. Okay. So a y k plus one equals b u k plus c n k. Okay. This is exactly the same as the previous uh, system model, okay? So you know, you know it very well that the first two part can be written in this form, yk plus one equal to theta transpose phi k, okay? So the rem all the remaining part is this. So this is exactly what's happening here. So this is the model, extended model of the system. 
So I think uh, I will stop here, and then we'll go through these details next time. Mm. Yeah, but I think I will use a different notation. It's not a typo, but I will use the notation C sub NC. NC is the order of uh, C to make the notation a little bit more rigorous, okay? So we'll come up. We'll, we'll talk about uh, details of this extended least squares not next time.